Cash Flow Diary Podcast, Episode 10. Congratulations, you showed up. Give yourself a high five in celebration of your success. Welcome to the Cash Flow Diary, where new and experienced investors come to take confident action towards their goals. Your host is a family man, a real estate entrepreneur, investor, coach, and instructor. As a master facilitator of Robert Kiyosaki's Cash Flow 101 game, he's inspired many to begin their journey into creating cash flow for themselves and their family. And now, here he is to offer you the tools required to earn the income desired. Your cash flow coach, Jay Massey. Hello, listeners. It's time for another entry into the diary. Welcome to episode 10 of the CashflowDiary.com podcast. For those of you joining us for the first time, make sure you go over to our website, CashflowDiary.com. Get your free ebook, currently free ebook. Investing Made Easier Wholesaling. For those of you who don't already know, uh, I started my investing career as a wholesaler, and what I've done is I've taken that and put it into an ebook complete with exercises and, and uh, additional work pages that you can fill out and complete. And for those of you who do get that particular ebook, we will be holding a webinar series on wholesaling, and you will be the first to know and the ones allowed to attend. Make sure you go over to the website, cashflowdiary.com, download that, and then go over to the first episode. That way you can find out a little bit more about me, about cashflowdiary.com, why it exists, etc. And then you can decide for yourself, do I need to keep listening and downloading more episodes or not? Hopefully you decide to. If not, no big deal, but we'll see you soon either way. Now, what I want to do is uh, talk about what episode 10 is going to be. Episode 10 is going to be your questions and my answers. Number one, your questions and my answers, number one. Basically, about every 10 episodes or so, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take all the questions that we keep receiving here at the CashflowDiary.com office and put them into an episode. I'm going to do my best to take the ones that I think we can answer in the time frame that we have and the ones that I believe will do the greatest amount of good for the most number of people, not just U.S. wide, but in some cases worldwide. So we get questions from all over the place, which is exciting. If you do have a question that you know you must have answered, feel free to send that in over to cashflowquestions at cashflowdiary.com. Again, that's cashflowquestions at cashflowdiary.com. So before we get into the questions and my answers, let's go with our cash flow quote. The quote is... Take the attitude of a student. Never be too big to ask questions. Never know too much to learn something new. That quote comes to us from Mr. Og Mandino. Actual name, Augustine Mandino II. Uh, For those of you who may not have known, he definitely has written many books. And one of the books is The Greatest Salesman in the World world. He has sold over 50 million copies. That's a lot of books. 50 million copies of all of his books combined, and it's been translated into 25 different languages. Amazing. Amazing. Just remember, take the attitude of a student. Never be too big to ask questions and never know too much to learn something new. I am that guy. I'm a perpetual student. I'm always learning more and more about people, about sales, about questions, about real estate. One of my favorite things to study is questions. In fact, there have been times where I've been known to go to a car dealership or even watch QVC just because I'm listening for the questions uh, that the greats ask. Because when you have good questions, you can get even better answers. And more importantly, you can find out how to help people with your product or service. And studying questions can be a great, great way to improve your skills. Definitely something I highly recommend. And there's no such thing as a question that you should not ask. And that's what I love about his comment is never to be too big to ask questions. Sometimes we can get ourselves into a situation and we think, you know what, it's not the right time, not the right place. It's a question I shouldn't ask. Of course, everybody knows it. No, everyone doesn't because you don't (laughs) and you are a part of everyone. So ask the question you never know. And never, never, and I love this, never know too much to learn something new. That is one of the Things that I I enjoy so much about real estate is that as I meet more and more people, you get to learn new ways of looking at things, new ways of analyzing property and running businesses, et cetera, et cetera. 
I get excited about all that stuff, and that's pretty much the job, right? So what we're going to do is I'm just going to take some of the questions that have uh, come in, do my best to answer them, and the first one comes to us, and I'm just going to read first names only, so if you ever want uh, me to actually state full name or websites or emails, feel free to let me know and in your email when you send them in, and I'll make sure I do that, but this one comes to us from John, and I'm just going to read the email that was sent in, uh, and one here, so here we go. It says, uh, hi, Jay Massey and team. Your podcast is awesome, by the way. If you start off an email that way, you have a good shot of making sure that I read your questions. Anyway, here are a couple of questions I hope you can answer in future podcast episodes. One, how do you estimate repair costs on a single family home? I was like, oh, well, that's a good one. And the reason he asked that question is because he said, I am interested in learning wholesaling, but I am concerned that I do not have the experience or knowledge to properly estimate repair costs when looking at a house. So I'm sure there's a number of us out there who have that. Uh, for those of you who have met me in person or been to one of my uh, seminars in person or seen me speak, you've probably heard me mention the fact that I've had a, my, a mechanical bypass. That That's what I call it. I am not the guy that you call to even hang a picture or even something as simple as change the light bulbs. I can personally attest to the fact that light bulbs stay out a very, very long time in my house simply because I the skill set of simply changing a light bulb is a little bit challenging for me. So the question becomes is, if you're going to play this real estate game, how on earth do you do rehabs? How on earth do you do wholesaling? How on earth do you do anything without this particular skill set? Well, this is what I was taught and what I do and what I suggest. There are a number of ways to gain this information, but before I answer that question first, John, what I want to say very directly is don't be concerned that you don't have the experience of knowledge. It's okay. You don't have the experience of knowledge. You're not supposed you can't have the experience or knowledge without having gone through the process. And this is one of the things that I've mentioned before, or definitely have taught uh, to the members or those who are partaking of our cash flow creation system information, uh, you know that you can't do two things at the same time. You cannot learn and look good. So you either look good because you already have the experience of knowledge or you don't look good because you're gaining the experience of knowledge. So I, if, you, if it's okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say what you're looking for is how can you gain this experience of knowledge with the least amount of exposure slash risk as humanly possible. That's what we're going to talk about. Well, one of the ways that I was able to do this is there's a book out there it's, uh, called the Home Cost Repair and Remodel uh, Guide, and it's published every year. Uh, it's published by Marshall Swift, so you can go to marshallswift.com and, and pick up that book, marshallswift.com. That book, it's probably going to set you back about $100, but it's the best $100 you will ever spend because what it does, and it has the ability to actually estimate either by component in place or rooms uh, the items that need to be actually fixed. And what's interesting about it is that it's good for the for the U.S. Uh, it's good in any zip code because what they do is they use a multiple uh, modification factor based upon the zip code that you are actually going to be performing the repairs in so and then they give you like a couple of categories to be able to flip through and go okay so if i want you know low quality mid quality great quality that type of thing and then you can multiply by a multiplier you can say well cool i need to replace three sinks in this particular single family house those three sinks should cost comp you know of rent you know, it's rental house quality uh, installed in this zip code they should cost x and then what you can do is you can use that as a baseline for uh, actually going over uh, to a contractor to be able to figure out hey can you do these things for this now what's interesting about this is that i've never run into a contractor who said that they can't do it uh the only question is is usually it's a negotiation of time etc and then you also have to consider, depending on the size of the project, uh, you may be involved uh, with Davis Bacon. If you're not familiar with Davis Bacon and anything regarding that particular regulation, uh, then it just means that you haven't done very, very large projects yet, uh, probably, and you haven't involved city or government funds. But 
even in those instances, you still have a good shot of using this as a guideline uh, for what things should cost. So that's good. So that is one way. Another way is to, and this is one of the best things about real estate, is that you can always leverage, right? There's a wise gentleman out there named Pete Fortunato. He says things like, use what you have to get what you need so you can have what you want. Use what you have to get what you need so you can have what you want. So what do you have? You have this particular property, right? Maybe you have it under contract. Maybe you have, uh, you, maybe you've closed on it. I don't know. So you have this property, but what do you need? You need someone who has the experience of estimating these repairs or even actually executing and doing it. Well, there are many of those people. So maybe what happens is that you give something that they need in order for you to get what you need. And now when I say that, don't think that means money all the time. Sometimes it it could just mean that they want uh, to understand how you did the deal. It could be knowledge. Knowledge, time, money, and credit, those are typically the four components inside deals. And you can go through those in various different ways. But if you have one, you can usually leverage for the other or others in that case. So In this particular case, what you're looking at is, hey, you've got the house. What you need is his or her knowledge. You put the two together so you can have what you want, which is usually, in this case, uh, if we're talking about wholesaling, we're just talking about an estimate. But if you actually want to come out with a completed house, they probably can help with that, too. So use what you have to get what you need so you can have what you want. That works out very, very well. If that doesn't work, Jen, what you do is you hire someone Uh, a contractor just simply to go around and you start following them. I mean, do whatever you can to just follow them everywhere you go or everywhere they go, I should say, and use them over and over and over and over again until you get it, until you feel the rhythm, because there's no other way to gain experience except by going through the process of making the mistakes and not knowing what you don't know. But here's the caution. The question is, is whom do you wish to be inside your real estate business? I decided very, very early that I didn't have that skill set, nor did I want it. So I had the gift of not having it. Therefore, it makes it very, very easy for me to never be tempted to try to fix or estimate all these things on my own. I would rather have people who have been doing it for decades uh, and use their knowledge, use their teams, use those things in order to uh, have the best quality deal possible. So even if I'm not intending on keeping the property, I still want the best quality property because it'll be associated with my name, uh, my brand, my whatever. And you want to make sure that your customer comes away with some of the absolute best product that you can provide. Sometimes that means not relying on your own experience. Okay. Here is another question. It says, what uh, real estate educational resources gave you the foundation for your knowledge and the ability to take action in the beginning of your career? Well, there are many different pieces to that question. Uh, and in, in my opinion, when it comes to you know real estate investing, you, you've got to have many pieces. You've got to obviously have some specialized knowledge as they talk about and think and grow rich. And you definitely have to exercise that knowledge. So uh, as what is mentioned in the slight edge by Jeff Olson, there's a time where for learning and there's a time for action. You got to put both together to be able to learn it. But one of the most important pieces, in my opinion, is environment or community. You've got to have that too. And when I got first started, there was an educational company out there that I attended that had those components all together. And in fact, that company still exists uh, right now because they're under the name of Renatus and I'm actually now an instructor for them, which is kind of interesting. But what is important uh, to understand is that you must find a way into communities like that that give you the ability and access to all of those components at the same time so that you can take advantage of what is called eustress. It's the exact opposite of distress. So EU stress. Eustress simply means that you are, you, it's that same thing that happens when you experience peer pressure. So if you're around a whole bunch of people who are learning the same things that you are doing, the same things that you uh, are and experiencing the same challenges that you are, but yet they're still succeeding 
at some point you start to feel weird for not taking the actions that you see the other people around you taking. And what begins to happen is that you, in order to still quote unquote fit in, you start taking the same actions. And you want to put yourself in that environment as much as you possibly can. And that's kind of the idea behind uh, the whole membership. That's kind of the idea behind the, the cash flow creation system. And for those of you who already know about it and who are there, you have access to that. And that's what we're building uh, for, for an online environment as well, so that you have some of those things together. But there's no such thing, and, and please remember this, there's no such thing as ever ending your learning process. We are all forever evolving, forever learning, and I still continually am learning and reading, it, et cetera, et cetera. Um, if you've been over to the website, you've seen you know, the virtual book club, and inside there you see a number of the books that I've either read or am reading. And for those of you, again, who are members, you understand the discussions that we're having about those books uh, as you know, we each go through them, etc., so that you can gain and glean more from each of those books to be able to go deeper, further, and and help yourselves become bigger, better, badder investors. So thanks, John, uh, for your questions. Again, for those of you who also have questions, feel free to send those into cashflow questions at cashflowdiary.com. What we're going to do now is I'm going to go over the cash flow question from last time. I believe the question was, in what country is the island located that Madonna references in her song La Isla Bonita? Now, for those of you who speak Spanish, please forgive me. I did the best I could, right? In what country is the island that Madonna references uh, in about her song La Isla Bonita? It was on her True Blue album, February 25th, 1987, and the country is none other than Belize. For those of you who have been uh, over to our Facebook page, you've probably seen some of the photos, etc. I was there uh, a little bit ago. Beautiful place. I cannot believe how beautiful this place is. I mean, you could take uh, you know, a kid's toy camera, go over there and accidentally snap the shutter and be upside down. And you'd probably get a postcard. I mean, just from the the photo that was out there, it was it is absolutely one of the most beautiful, colorful places that I have ever seen. The people were great. The food was great. The company was great. I mean, wow, it was just amazing. Anyway, this week's question. This week's question. Now, remember, guys, these questions are designed to you know intrigue the brain and to help you. Uh, in your journey of increasing your financial IQ, making sure that you continue to become bigger, better investors, not only just from the information that you hear, from the guests that you hear, et cetera, but also from understanding little things like this. So this is actually something, the answer to this question is something that I'm doing right now, and that's pretty much what inspired the question. So during your due diligence period, what is the name of the process you follow when you are ensuring the rent roll is accurate. I'll repeat. During your due diligence period, what is the name of the process you follow when ensuring the rent roll is accurate? See, one of the things you may or may not have realized is that when sometimes when you are in the process of purchasing a property, which one of the things you're going to ask for is a rent roll. It's just a, a the seller submits to you a document that says these are who is these are the people that are staying in the property and this is what they've been paying this is what the experience history has been on the income and the expenses etc it's not quite a profit and loss statement it's not quite a PL. it's a rent roll and when you get that you have to ensure that it's accurate and there's a process for that just make sure what you do is uh, that you do do this process. And what I'm asking for is the name of that process. So that'll be the question we will definitely answer on the next episode. Let's get back to the other questions that have come in. This one has come uh, comes to us from Jim, and it goes as follows. It says, hi, Jay. I heard you speak here in Chicago. I loved it. Thank you so much. And again, that's another good way to make sure that your question gets read is starting off with a compliment. Uh, Jim, thank you. I did have a fun time in Chicago with you guys for a couple of days, and uh, it was awesome. So, and he, he continues, he says, I know you started in wholesaling, and that is what I need to do starting out. How do I wholesale an owner-financed property? Great question. Great question. That is one of the things that I did to assist my um, 
wholesaling business in a great way is to figure out ways to provide financing uh, within the purchase. So what it comes down to uh, is when it when you're looking to be able to do wholesaling or when you're trying to wholesale something that is owner financed, well, understand something, understand the following. At the end of the day, what you're trying to do is you're solving problems. That's what your business does. It solves problems and it just happens to relate to real estate. So in order to wholesale a owner finance property, you must negotiate with the seller what is known as non-recourse financing that does not, keywords here, that does not require the seller's approval of the actual end buyer. Now, this is all disclosed. We are always disclosing. Okay, there's nothing hidden. There's no trick. There's none of the sneaky stuff. Um, it's all above board in writing, etc. You just got to let the seller know that this is how you do your business and that you will close. So, so long as the financing is non-recourse, which most seller financing is, not all, but most, uh, can be, especially if you negotiate them, it typically can be assumed and or sold to any other particular party or buyer. And it's just part of the transaction, but it's actually a very, very valuable part of the transaction when you think about it. Because if a property is priced properly for its condition, location, etc., that in and of itself doesn't mean that someone has the cash to pay for it. So there's always going to be some sort of financing involved. So even if you pay for it all cash, that's still a financing method, all right, because you're now paying an opportunity cost instead of an interest rate. So just keep that in mind. So uh, when in your wholesaling an owner finance property, it's just the same thing. The transaction is the same. It's just that you have an additional thing to negotiate. Now you have to negotiate the terms of the owner carry. You know, is it going to be a note with a balloon? Is it going to be fully amortizing? Is it going to be interest only? Uh, is it going to have monthly payments, quarterly payments? Are you going to have annual payments? When do payments start? Now, keep in mind that because you're negotiating owner financing and just because banks like to receive money every 30 days doesn't mean that that's what you have to negotiate. That may not always be what's in the best interest of the seller or the buyer. And you need to be in a position to ascertain that, understand it, so that you can, again, solve problems because that's what we do. We solve problems. Thanks, Jim, for that question. Last question today uh, comes to us from Lance. Lance, uh, this is what he has to say. He says, thanks, Jay. I listened to all of your podcasts today. That's amazing. Uh, he listened to all of the podcasts today. Is wholesaling possible without doing yellow letters in the U.S.? And if, um, and if you can't meet in person with your seller, how do you close a deal? Is there a way not to spend a lot on marketing and get in touch with sellers? Thank you, Jay. Okay, so here's 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 the answers. Um, one of the unique things, for those of you who have listened to the first episode, you already know this, but one of the unique things is that I was not afforded the opportunity of a marketing budget when I first started. I barely had the funds to eat. So um, that, was, that was just the reality of the situation. So everything that I've learned to do has to be darn near free or really close to free in order to make that happen. I, I don't. I have personally... Uh, not used, you know, yellow letters. I've tried direct mail for when I when I purchase notes, etc. And you know that works. There's nothing wrong with it. It is, you know, can be a little expensive. There's nothing wrong with yellow letters. So I want to state that uh, first and foremost, yellow letters work. And at the end of the day, it's all about what you're going to do. In fact, let me say this: everything works, nothing doesn't. And what's most important, the best. Here is the key. Here's the secret. I know some of you are thinking it. What is the absolute best marketing method? The best marketing method is the one that you're going to do consistently, period. I don't care if that means you tattoo on your forehead uh, an 800 number and you walk around. It, that's fine. Someone will call you simply because they want to know why on earth is this person walking around with a number on their forehead, okay? Here's the point. What you do is is not as relevant as that you do to me, all right? So is wholesaling possible without doing any of those yellow letters? Absolutely, no matter your location. But what is impossible is that if you don't tell anybody that you're looking to buy property, you, you never will. So you must have some method 
of getting in front of people who have the property that you are looking to purchase. Because as a wholesaler, your inventory is a contract, not the house. So if you have nothing under contract, you have nothing to sell. All right, so keep that in mind. So you must come up with a system, a way of making sure that people know that, hey, you're looking to buy property from them, whatever that is. Okay, and and if you can't meet in person with the seller, that doesn't really matter to me because remember, uh, the my investor identity is such that I don't need to see the person or the property because there are other people who need to see the person or the property. Uh, I don't need to see you in order to buy a piece of property from you. In fact, I can count on like one hand the number of actual sellers that I've seen. In fact, I, I've never even closed um, any of my transactions and I've done hundreds now in eight different states and, and we have hundreds of units in five different states. Uh, I've never, I can't remember a time there might've been one where I've actually went to an escrow or a title company and physically signed the paperwork. Most of the time I close, uh, the, uh, using FedEx or UPS or some sort of method that way. And there have been many times where I've closed transactions without ever meeting the seller or the property. Um, in fact, there are many properties I still haven't seen, uh, but that's, you know, besides the point. And then I'm comfortable doing that. You may not be that comfortable because I look at, uh, real estate as a, um, very much through the eyes of a financial planner, because that's what I was. That's what I used to do a long time ago. Right. Don't do that anymore. I'm not licensed anymore. None of those things. But when I look at it, I look at it as a stream of income. I don't need to see the property to analyze a stream of income. I do like to see the property to look for additional opportunities and additional um, uh, warnings or threats. Those I like. That's the reason I like to go see a property these days. Not because I intend on <laughs> doing the repairs myself or anything of that nature. So if you can't meet with a seller in person, in my opinion, that's okay. That's great. That means you can be more efficient. And you can talk to more people. Um, you can do a lot of business just in your car on the phone or you know, at home or in Starbucks or whatever coffee shop you prefer. So uh, closing that deal just simply means you now have to do uh, a closing, uh, usually through uh, FedEx or UPS or some sort of registered mail service. And you got to work with a title and or escrow company that understands what you're doing and that you don't have an intention of physically showing up. So you probably going to spend a grip load of money on notaries. At least I do. I know all about it. And that's pretty much what you're going to end up doing. And there's nothing wrong with that, but that's just one way of doing it. So is there a way to not spend a lot on marketing and get in touch with sellers? Absolutely, Lance, because this is probably the most important thing uh, that all of us can do more and we all need to do more of is that we must now develop a system for making it easy for people to understand that we want their business and more importantly, we want their referrals. So the way to not have to spend a lot of money on marketing is give other people a reason to market for you. So for example, what does that mean? Uh, if you've completed a transaction with anyone and it went well, well, give them a reason to want to talk more about you in that transaction. Now see, some people are naturally going to do it, which is great. And what that what ends up happening is that they start talking about that transaction to other people and their friends and what happens and they go, wow, how, how can I do that? But because you didn't tell them, hey, if any of your friends or family members says something like, you know, that they want to do this too, could you please send them to me? Simply because you didn't say that, they don't think on their own to go, well, you need to call my guy or my gal, and I'm sure they can help you too. We've got to be clear and making sure that people understand that, that we are never too busy <laughs> for you know, their referrals. If you've ever attended a training by Brian Buffini, you kind of understand exactly what I'm going through or what I'm saying, because that's one of the things that as a financial planner, I had to get good at is making sure that we got business by referrals because you couldn't necessarily advertise. You can't put in yellow pages, couldn't put out ads on Craigslist, all this other stuff. Hey, let me be your financial planner. That doesn't really work. It had to come by referral. And that was what we must all become good at doing more and more and more and more and more so that we don't have to spend money on marketing because we can't compete with the big guy who has the budget to spend money on a you know, Super Bowl commercial or something of that nature. We have to figure out bigger, better ways uh, to make that happen. And that we also have to understand our unique selling proposition, i.e., 
Why should someone sell their property to us as opposed to a realtor? Uh, what on earth are we bringing to the table? What problems are we solving? And if you focus on solutions to people's problems, people know people who have problems like themselves, and it becomes very, very easy to continually solve and brand yourself as a person who solves a particular type of problem. So what ends up happening is that instead of you having to, quote unquote, get in touch with sellers, they start getting in touch with you and you become known as a problem solver. And that's the goal. You want to become known as the problem solver. One of the things that uh, I like is that I'm known as a problem solver. One of the things that has happened to me in the past is, believe it or not, one of my sources uh, for finding our property has become a local code enforcement because we're known for solving problems. So code enforcement calls us and says, hey, th there's a problem over here with this particular property. Here's the owner, et cetera. Can you help? And it's only because we've solved other I have problems with properties and with the assistance of code enforcement. And see, code enforcement isn't an enemy. They're, they're, they can be your greatest friends. Same thing with the anti-neglect or fire departments, etc. These individuals are charged with keeping their city safe and clean, etc. And making sure property, properties look, you know, relatively decent. Well, you could become that very person that's known as making their properties always look relatively decent. And here's a secret. Those properties, you can pick them up really, really, really cheap. So keep that in mind as you're going out there. Hopefully, Lance, those answers, that answers your questions. And I'm sure it answers a few more questions for a few more people out there. Anyway, uh, that's all the time we have questions or all the time we have for the questions at this moment. Again, if you've got questions, you want them answered, feel free to send those in to cashflowquestions at cashflowdiary.com. My final comment is actually another quote about questions, and it comes to us from the management expert himself, Mr. Peter Drucker. He simply says, my greatest strength as a consultant is to be ignorant and ask a few questions. Till next time. Thank you for investing your time with Jay Massey and the Cash Flow Diary. When you have a moment, please visit iTunes and leave a positive comment about the show. And go now to our website, CashflowDiary.com, to take advantage of our free business building course, Cash Flow Foundation. Gain the knowledge, understanding, and skill that will teach you how to never need a job again. Until next time. Until next time. Until next time.